This is a wildlife photography setup that I've put together for 350 US dollars. First of all, what do we look for in a camera for wildlife photography? We're looking for weather sealing, ergonomics, autofocus performance, and ideally low light performance. This is a D300. It was released in 2007. It used to cost $1,800. Now you can buy it for 150. The autofocus performance is exemplary. The ergonomics are superb and every setting you might want is available at the press of a button without having to go into menus. Exposure compensation right here. Switch between manual mode, aperture priority, program and shutter priority right here. Easily switch between white balance settings, ISO settings, quality level even though I just keep that at raw all the time. Now my preferred way of shooting this camera is the same preferred way recommended by many wildlife shooters. Manual mode with auto ISO, ISO auto. So I set the shutter speed and then the aperture. Keeping in mind the depth of field required, I adjust these two numbers and the ISO adjusts accordingly. This is a very comfortable camera to hold and I've used it successfully in very cold conditions. The thousand shot battery life really helps and can shoot at six frames per second. 12 bit raw. If you shoot 14-bit RAW, it goes down to 2.5 frames per second. But I just shoot in 12-bit RAW and I mostly shoot in bursts. It has only 12 megapixels, which limits your ability to crop. But the real downside is high ISO performance. Above 800 ISO or so, things start to get a little noisy. Above 1600 ISO, you would have to spend some time in noise reduction software. Now let's talk about the lens. What do we look for in a wildlife lens? Well, first and foremost, we need reach. This is a 300 millimeter lens, which makes it a 450 millimeter equivalent on a crop sensor like the D300. It's fast enough for my purposes. Wide open, you can shoot it at f4. It's made in Japan. Very, very sturdy construction. This is the Nikon 300 millimeter AF ED lens. <clears throat> now I know what you're thinking. ED actually stands for extra low dispersion, which helps with sharpness, increased contrast, and helps combat chromatic aberration. Incidentally, chromatic aberration is one of the weaknesses of this lens. Otherwise, I can't complain. It's a very sturdy lens and inspires confidence. It's built like a tank with metal construction and an integrated lens hood that easily retracts. I was able to buy this lens for $200. It was originally released in 1987 and was only replaced in the year 2000 by the new AFS lens. One of the downsides to this lens is that it doesn't have any vibration reduction, which requires you to shoot at faster shutter speeds even for still subjects to control for camera and lens shake. It features a tripod collar here. You cannot remove it, but you can certainly adjust it. I have it set to the top of the lens because I'm not currently using this camera and lens with a tripod, so I would just have it up here to create an additional place for my thumb to rest. It's very comfortable to hold and even features a very flexible focus limiter here. This is a confusing limiter for a lot of people. Essentially, if you set it to full, the lens will focus on anything from the minimum focusing distance of 2.5 meters to infinity. If you set it to somewhere towards the right, the lens will only focus from that distance to infinity. So from 3 meters or 10 feet to infinity. And if you set it to the left, it will only focus from the minimum focusing distance to that distance. So from minimum focusing to 8 meters or 25 feet. This is useful if you're taking pictures up close. Now, this may look confusing, but it greatly helps when you want faster autofocus out of this lens. It uses an 82 millimeter filter thread. I was able to save some money because the lens I bought has a slightly busted uh, filter thread, so I can't actually attach front facing filters, but it wasn't a big deal because I wasn't planning on putting on any filters anyway. The lens also has a drop in filter right here. Right now I just have the clear Nikon filter that comes with the lens. I don't want to take it out because I don't want any dust to get on it. To go from its minimum focusing distance of 2.5 meters to infinity. And if you don't employ the focus limiter, this can be frustrating. The autofocus mechanism is far from silent. So it's a $150 camera and a $200 used lens. These days, wildlife setups are often in the thousands, if not more than $10,000. So let's see how this setup 
performs, especially when in the hands of this photographer, someone who has no experience with wildlife photography. The very first day of shooting was at the zoo. I was dealing with soft winter light, so the light wasn't great, but at least it was uniform. And this was on the very first day of using this camera and lens combination, and I was pretty happy with the results. Now at the zoo, the animals are big and they don't move very quickly. The 450 millimeter equivalent field of view allowed me to reasonably fill the frame with these animals. I'm not an expert on zoos, but my top tip is to get there as early as you can and make one loop of the entire zoo first so you know what you're dealing with. It helps to get some advice from people that work at the zoo to see what animals are in fact active and which ones will become active later in the day. Wherever possible, I looked for interactions between animals and clear signs of movement. Where this setup was particularly weak was indoors. When you go into the reptile section, for example, you can see how weak this sensor performs at ISOs of 3200 and above. My ideal zoo setup would probably be a DX camera for the outdoors and a full frame camera with a macro lens indoors. Now with today's noise reduction algorithms, it isn't such a big deal. But I was much more focused, again, on getting some kind of emotion in the shot, some kind of mood, some interaction between the animals. To always look for eye contact with the animal with a catch light. You want to see the reflection of the light in their eyes, because if you don't see that, the animal looks like it's dead or it looks like it's from hell. Okay, so it's always better to have some kind of catch light it just makes the animals look more lifelike. On day two, I went to a local pond. And right away, you can see how much worse the shots are because nothing here is staged. I was just taking pictures of birds and I was very limited by the direction of the light. I tried to get pictures of birds in motion and I know that my shutter speed has to be at least one over a thousands of a second, really, to have a hope of keeping a bird sharp as it flies. I knew that if my shutter speed was too fast, I would have to pump up the ISO. and That's simply not something I wanna do with this camera. All of these shots required noise reduction in post because once you go above ISO 800 or so with this camera, things start to get a little noisy. For larger wildlife and animals, I think this would be a great combination even today. But if you're looking to take pictures of small birds, or animals at dusk or at dawn where you need that higher ISO performance, I would recommend buying a newer camera, one that can give you better performance at ISOs of 3200 and above. Based on the advice I got from some bird watchers, I went to a local park in search of an interesting subject. And I'd like to tell you a story about two different owls. You see, on this particular very, very cold winter day, there were two owls in the park. The first one had four photographers shooting it. I was one of them. I got my shots and I was pretty happy with them. The light was good, it was decent enough. I was able to get some kind of background separation. And even though I messed up with the depth of field, I should have been shooting at f8 to get more of the owl in focus. I was still able to get the eyes in focus and that was the most important thing for me. One or two stops of better ISO performance and everything would have been great. I also wanted to get an interesting crop of just the eyes of the owl, and that's where the 12 megapixel limitation really kicked in. While I was shooting this owl, people told me about a different owl on the other side of the park, surrounded by dozens of photographers. So naturally, I went over there to find out what was going on, and turns out it was an owl that was facing the wrong way, away from the light, covered by branches, and sleeping. And nevertheless, this owl had around 40 photographers near it, some of them with very, very expensive gear. But if they had only listened to local bird watchers, they would have been able to capture at least some shots of owl number one. Just goes to show how important it is to be aware of the direction of the light at all times. It also highlighted the importance of staying with a particular subject. I was too excited about potentially capturing two different owls in one day that I didn't give enough attention to the first owl. I could have found a better composition. I could have played around with deeper depth of field. Instead, I was rushing between different areas of the park. Probably didn't get the best shot that I could that day. I'd also like to show you a photo of the same little owl that I took pictures of, except one hour later, when the sun was dropping. Look how horrible it is. I think even if I had a very expensive camera, 
just the lack of light on the subject would make it uninteresting. All in all, I had a lot of fun shooting with this kit and learning more about techniques and best practices for wildlife photography. As I'm just a casual person, I don't have any plans to go on a safari. I'm looking forward to using this setup in better light. And as I get more information about the best possible places uh, to see birds and other wildlife, I'm sure my photography will improve with practice. I'm excited about how much performance I can squeeze out of a budget setup like this. And I've actually ordered a Kenko 1.4x teleconverter, so I'll see whether that improves things or not. If you're looking to purchase a wildlife kit, I've arranged on this slide some common camera and lens options. The top row is a progression of Nikon DSLRs. The middle row is a progression of primes. From left to right, they get more expensive and with better performance. And the bottom row is a progression of zoom lenses. The prices are in US dollars. If you see only one number, it's the used price on eBay. If you see two numbers, it's the new price followed by the used price on eBay. Based on your budget constraints and requirements, you can mix and match any combination of these. There is a lot of value on the used market these days as people increasingly switch to mirrorless. Now that mirrorless cameras and their autofocus and eye detect algorithms are getting more and more advanced. This opens up a lot of options for people who are trying to do wildlife on a budget. If you have experience with budget wildlife setups, let us know in the comment section. And as always, thank you for watching and subscribe for more.